three, two, one. guest that is joining us tonight uh, as someone that um, in my career, um, you know, I look back on the last 10 years and, and I think this is one of the reasons why this group and community has been so successful is, uh, you know, we recognize how much we need just a beacon of something to look for. And unfortunately, early in my career, I didn't have that. And um, being able to look at Jamie and, and what she is accomplishing and what she is setting the path forward for this industry of women, specifically in, in my industry and career, it's uh, incredible to be able to share uh, in this hour with Jamie Little. So Jamie Little is in her 21st year as a professional broadcast broadcaster. She is with Fox Sports and fills many roles with them. Uh, last year, she started as lead play-by-play -play for the Arkham Menard series. She's also lead pit reporter on NASCAR and many others. And when she is not at home in Indianapolis filling some other roles, she is on the road. Uh, and I know we're going to break into the clash conversation. And I know that's a lot of what people want to hear. But Jamie, I want to go ahead and go right back to the beginning of this professional life for you. How did it start? And what gigs were you looking at towards the beginning of your career? Well, hello, everyone. I'm so proud and honored to be here tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you for giving us your time this evening. Um, I don't know if anybody else has a glass of wine, but I guess it's okay, right? Um, Amanda's doing the interviews, so I guess I can have some wine, right? <laughs> it's been a long week. Um, but yes, Amanda, it's, I mean, you said it, 21st year. That's just crazy to me because I still feel young, you know, and, and there are instances like a year ago that I feel like I'm still a rookie in some ways. And I really was when I went in the booth for the first time, but going back to it, it's, it's funny because I was a tomboy. I was raised by a single mom, no brothers or sisters, but I, I was born in Lake Tahoe. So naturally, you know, you love being outdoors and you like riding like four wheelers and I rode horses and like, I just love the outdoors. Well, there was just an affinity that I had for the smell of gasoline and anything motorized. I just loved it. And we moved to Las Vegas when I was 13. And I met some guys, of course, that I wanted to hang out with. They rode dirt bikes, and I just thought it was the coolest thing. And then as I got to know more of them who raced, I realized, like, man, they have really neat stories. And I would read Dirt Rider magazine. I started bringing them to my classes in high school. Of course, people thought I was freaking weird. My mom didn't know where I came from. And it, I really loved it. And, and then I quickly realized at 18 years old when I moved out, there are no women that are talking about this sport that I love so much. It's all men. And the only women that are featured are the ones modeling, which there was nothing wrong with that. But I just thought, man, I'm going to become that woman. Why can't I be there interviewing them? Why can't I hold that microphone? And literally, that's how it all started. I never set out to be a broadcaster or a star or any of those things. It was just, I want to fill this role because I love it so much. And I want to share these stories with people at home. And it literally started with me writing for supercross.com, doing interviews and getting to know the writers. And then it went into the live announcing position. I was 20 years old and the job opened up and I was going to college at the time because I realized, okay, I'm onto something, but I need to get my journalism degree. So I'd go to school during the week. I'd jump on a plane on Friday. I'd, I'd fly to the Supercross race, wherever it was, whatever stadium. And I was the live announcer on the floor and I'd get paid like $500. And, um, and that really set me up to learn live television. And then the sky was the limit. And I literally never looked at it and said, well, one day I want to do the Indy 500 or one day I want to do NASCAR. It literally just kind of happened. The more I loved it, the more opportunity I was given with ESPN and, and here I am. But I, I thank my love and passion for motorsports for my career. What was the first gig? When did you know that, hey, this is going to be a path that I'm going to continue forward in? I went up to, I was at a race in San Diego when I was going to school there and there was a guy with an ESPN microphone and he was covering the race, you know, with his own camera. And I went up to him and I'm like, who do you work for? What, is, what are you doing? And 
He said, well, I'm a freelancer and I shoot for ESPN2 for a show called Moto World. And I'm sure many of you on this know that show. It was like early 90s, mid 90s, late 90s. And, um, and I said, well, I would love to tag along sometime just to kind of watch and see. Well, it turned out he owned the site supercross.com and he took me under his wing and we literally would cover all these desert races in San Diego. We'd go to the supercrosses, I'd get credentialed and it would be my hand in the shot on TV. And I was like, mom, you've got to watch ESPN too. My hand is in there. I was there. And <laughs> That was my first time. And I, I, I learned how to write and then I'd do my stand-ups and do my practicing. But my first job on ESPN2, like where it was really me, was rock crawling of all things in New Mexico. They're like, all right, we'll throw you a bone. You're not getting paid. Don't tell anybody. I'm like, I don't care. And I did it. And I just, I loved it. I've always just loved what I do, anything motors related. And and it paid off. I did that for two and a half years, by the way, with him while I was going to school, not getting paid. And um, and Amanda, I don't know if you're, I think you're going to ask about it, but this is that microphone. The first one I ever <laughs> used from S10 2 Somebody got it for me, shocked me. And it's just one of those prized things to me because this is where it all began. When you look back at those early years, what do you think were some of the traits to your skill or to your job that you learned then that you've now carried forward? I think my ability to really care about the people that you're interviewing, you know, I heard that a lot early in my career and I, I always remembered it, that I was, I was passionate. Um, I, I cared about what they said. I wasn't just asking them a question because I was on TV. Um, and I think just my genuine passion for, for what I did and being there and my thirst for knowledge and understanding it and telling those stories. Um, it's still to this day. I mean, I, I literally have the same feeling, especially covering something brand new like we just did this weekend. Well, as we continue to open up this conversation, just as a reminder to everyone, the chat room is there for you to also ask questions. We are going to open this up to a Q&A towards the last quarter of this conversation. But uh, uh, as we continue on, Jamie, I know uh, one of those first gigs also uh, was part of the X Games. What was that like? The X Games were incredible. Um, I actually in 2000 for, I don't even remember how I got the job, but I did something called the Gravity Games, which was NBC's version of the X Games. And I was already kind of getting my foot in the door with the SPN. So when they saw me do that, they're like, okay, we need you to do X Games. And it was the most incredible time in 2001 and beyond because dirt bikes, which you see one flying over my, my shoulder there, um, was really getting big and they started pushing the limits and doing backflips and and I was there to be able to document it all you know I was a kid basically but we were going through this incredible time Travis Pastrana came onto the scene and um, it was just it taught me so much about being a broadcaster and covering live events and being enthusiastic and it, it was just there were so many legendary moments covering x games I mean the legendary moments, the scary moments, the injuries, I mean, all of that was a wild time for sure. And um, I did X Games all the way up until that picture was actually my last X Games in 2015. Um, it was at Coda, which now you know we raced there in NASCAR. So it came full circle for me, but that it was, I'll always cherish those moments doing X Games. They're not as cool now, by the way, but back then it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> in the early years, did you have women around you or colleagues or counterparts that you could share along this journey with? You know, I heard you say, Amanda, early on in your career, you really didn't have that. And I didn't either. So I didn't know better. I mean, I just was doing what I wanted to do. And my mom was the type of mom as a single lady and woman. She taught me that, you know, hard work is genderless. And if you want to do it, do it. My mom has a great rags to riches story that I witnessed as a child. And I just never, I, I guess I had blinders on kind of. I just went in and I, I never was intimidated by men. Um, I wanted to win over the tough ones that didn't believe in having a woman there. And I still do to this day. Um, but I just saw myself as, as one of them. And I always wanted to be seen as one of them or the best of them was kind of my mentality. Well, you did uh, eventually earn that paycheck from ESPN. When did they come calling and what was that start of the stage for you? 
That was back in, after I had done those gravity games, I remember going to ESPN. I'm like, all right, they know who I am. They've seen my hand in this shot. They've seen me on gravity games. And I asked and asked and asked around, who is the person in charge of hiring talent at ESPN for the motorsports department? And it took a while, but I finally got the name of the guy. His name was Rich Feinberg. I got his number and I called him. And I remember I was at my mom's house when I did this and she was like eavesdropping. And I sold myself for 20 minutes. I basically said, I've done this, this, and this. If you give me a shot, I won't let you down. And he hired me for X Games. And then it literally went to the next gig and the next gig. And, and in 2004, he came to me in January and said, what do you know about IndyCar racing? And I said, honestly, nothing. I'm a West Coast girl. Like I, four wheels was never kind of my thing. I said, but it's racing mentality. I can figure it out. So six weeks later, I was covering my first IndyCar race at Homestead Miami Speedway, calling my first pit stop, which I was like an out of body experience because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, that's kind of how it progressed. And Rich Feinberg was my boss, um, gosh, right until the end, 2014, when I signed with Fox is, is the last time we had worked together. So how do you do that? How do you get up to speed in a motorsport or in, I know you've covered uh, things that aren't necessarily all uh, wheel related. I think there were some four-legged companions that you've uh, been the sideline on as well, but how do you get up to speed in a space that you're not familiar with? I think it's all about finding the way that you craft things. It's a craft that you do. And I think if you know how to research and how to find the angles that fit your ability to tell a story is the key. I always tell people, especially in motorsports, I mean, you all know the stats are this big. You, I mean, the sky is the limit when it comes to telling a story about somebody in racing. It's all stats. There's so much information. I realized when I came into NASCAR, I had to learn to trim the fat. Just what is important to me? What stories do I want to tell? It's not what he's telling. It's not what he's talking about. And, and that really helps, you know? Um, and I kind of do that no matter what it is, whether it's, you know, a dog show or it's IndyCar, NASCAR. And then it, it comes down to relationships. You know that, I mean, it's, it's all about relationships. That information that you can extract from somebody and go on the air and tell is better than any note you'll ever get. Is there a commonality you find throughout drivers and athletes, no matter what sport they're in? I just think that that thirst for competition and the way that they go about their process is always fascinating to me. Um, there's definitely that commonality. And, you know, in X Games, Winter X Games, I got to cover a lot of the Olympic style sports like um, Snowboarder X, which is downhill racing. Like there's so much in there you know, many of them are, are from other countries and just that mentality of, of competition and racing, like it's about, you know, it's the same throughout. And I love that. Well, I know, uh, and, and thank you for everyone that also listened to the podcast, but one of the things that we covered during that was the first that you have accomplished. You were the first female pit reporter at the Indy 500. You were the first female reporter to cover the Indy 500 and Daytona. Uh, during the same season. And most recently, you became the first female to be the head play by play on a national motorsports series. And I called you a trailblazer <clears throat> during that interview. And are you comfortable with saying that now that you are opening these doors and you're a trailblazer in this industry? Well, thank you for saying that. I don't think we ever necessarily set out to be a trailblazer. It, again, it, it's just something that's come along. And I embrace it. I see it also as a responsibility because I want to further this for women. I want to open more doors. I want to open eyes, you know, for producers that weren't sure that a woman in the booth would be a good thing. Hopefully they know we can do it and people are going to like it and people are going to watch. Um, and that's kind of become kind of my mission statement, I guess now. So yes, I, I embrace the trailblazing and I embrace other women who are doing it and knocking down the doors. I just want others to know that if you want to do it, you can do it. You just, you need people to believe in you. You know, producers like Pam Miller, obviously she's a big believer in that, but it's just getting people in front of the camera saying we can do it. And, you know, when I go back to the Danica Patrick story, Danica Patrick wouldn't be Danica Patrick if it wasn't for Bobby Rahal 
giving her a chance. And that's what I'm trying to do when it comes to television. Can you remember the morning driving into Indy for that 500? Oh my gosh. Yes. It was, a, that's when we used to spend the whole month there. So I spent the whole month I wasn't supposed to do my first Indy 500 in 2004. They had the men lined up and that was fine. Those were all yeah, uh, unbelievable broadcasters that have been there forever. Um, but I was going to be part of the practice and qualifying shows. And I just jumped in full bore. I loved every second of it. I just absorbed all of the history of that place and those drivers and the names. I got Pernelli Jones to cry in an interview. And it was like, my producer was flipping out like, I mean, it was just those memories. It was amazing. And then my boss came to me and he was like, listen, we want you to be on pit road. You're going to be the fourth reporter. And I was like, awesome. You know, that's great. I should be, I've been doing the whole series. Why wouldn't I do this? But the night before the Indy 500, I called my mom and I was like, mom, we just took a picture today. The ABC crew, it is like 10 men who have combined probably covered 150 Indy 500s and been around that long. And I'm in the middle, what the hell am I doing here? And she said, do what you've always done. Be yourself, you know the sport, have fun with it. And I did, and it was an eight and a half hour broadcast that we never left even with rain. So it was an incredible day, but I remember those butterflies pulling into the track. Do you still get butterflies today? I do, but not in the nervous way, except for when I go to the booth because it is so new. But, you know, like this weekend at the Clash, you get the nerves of excitement. Like, I can't wait to show this off to people. I can't wait to tell the stories of these guys, what they're thinking and feeling and interview them in the moment. Um, I still, I, I get that feeling because I care so much still. So I, and again, I know that uh, some on the podcast may know the answer to this, but I want to treat this as if, uh, as if we may not have heard it yet. How did the Arca Menards role come about? <laughs> It's funny because it was one of those things that I'm comfortable being a pit reporter. It's what I've always done. I, it's my bread and butter. I just, I love it. And I, I cover all the NASCAR series from pit road, but I, uh, obviously over the years, it's crossed my mind. It's like what I want to do the booth, you know, I, I, that's a totally new role. And in my heart, I was like, I just can't imagine being away from the pits, being away from the action, not being immersed in the people that are making the show happen. And I got a call, this was November of um, 2020. And it was, you know, the end of the season, it was COVID. I got a call from Lee Diffie, amazing broadcaster, incredible man from NBC. We know each other, we can text every once in a while, but I never talked to him on the phone. And he calls and says, hey, you're gonna think this is crazy, but other women are getting promoted to the booth. And I think it's time that we have a woman in motorsports and you're the one to do it. And I thought, wow, that, that's a heck of a compliment. Well, thanks. I, you know, I, maybe, maybe this is the butt, you know, the butt kicking I needed, you know, go do it. I literally thought about it for 10 minutes, drove straight home and I emailed my boss at Fox and said, hey, I'm ready for this. I know there's no openings. I don't wanna take anybody's job. But if there is an opening somewhere for a practice or qualifying, give me a call. I want to try it. I need to. And uh, he's like, absolutely. So a week and a half later, he called. He said, hey, um, would you want to do the Arkham Menard series? I'm like, like, as in the whole series, not just a race. And I said, absolutely. I've never covered an Arca race. I really don't know anything about those drivers or that series, but I'll do it. And, um, and so that's how it went, literally. And how did you start preparing for that? A brand new role, a brand new series. I would imagine you you said that the nerves are there, but yes. there's something to be said about the edge of your comfort zone and how to push through that. Yes, being out of your comfort zone is, is so key and it's so easy. I'm 43 now and I'm comfortable being a pit reporter. So it's really easy just to stay there. I've got a lot going on you know, outside of racing, but I also like to push and I like to be out of my comfort zone. I like taking risks. It's what I've always done. I'm an adrenaline junkie. So I thought, why not? You know, I, I did have moments leading up to the first race that I would look at my husband and say, am I going to tarnish my reputation as a broadcaster? What if this fails? What if I'm not good at it? And he said, you can't think like that. Just be yourself and do what you've always done. Don't try to be like anybody before you. And he was exactly right. And I think that's hard sometimes when any of us get into a new role 
that we've never done, but we've always watched other people do it. You wonder, do I need to be like them? Are they going to accept the way that I do it? And, um, and that's an interesting place to be, but, um, yeah, it, it's, I started right away. I started just kind of looking at the driver lineup in, um, ARCA and looking at, you know, past races and my bosses, God bless them. They had a great idea of doing, um, some rehearsal on zoom, which was the most awkward thing. And Pam can attest, it was so weird. I was calling a race. Like I'm talking to you guys with Phil Parsons in Charlotte on zoom with all the producers listening. I'm like, this is so awkward and so strange because I've never done it. And then we got to do one in person in Charlotte before the big event. And then there was nothing better than being with him in the booth and having that natural energy and being able to see him and feed off of that energy. Knowing that people were tuning in to see you as the first female on a national motorsports broadcast, how did that raise the pressure of the moment? It did because of all races to start Daytona. I don't care what you're racing, you can race bicycles in Daytona. It's a big deal. And uh, I remember just thinking like, there's so many eyes. There was so much media exposure. I'd never done more interviews. I mean, everything from, you know, Fortune Magazine to Sports Illustrated and like outlets that didn't even cover motorsports wanted to know about this. And I gladly said yes to every one of them. I wanted to spread the word of what we were doing. And, um, but then the pressure was building like, oh my God, I'm just tired of talking about, it. I just want to do it. And um, we went there and, and, you know, the, the nerves were there, but I, the camera came on and that comfort of like, I know what to do here. We did it. There were moments that were kind of bumpy and there were moments that were so awesome and felt natural. And I'm like, this is really fun up here. This is a great perspective. And it's weird talking the whole time. I'm an emotional woman, but I'm, I'm really not a crier. And I got done with that. And I went down in the garage at Daytona, got in my car and I just broke down. I'm like, I did it. I mean, they might not want me back for the next race, but I freaking did it. <laughs> there was a lot of pressure for sure. I think there's a lot to be said about even taking that risk. Well done, Jamie. And uh, when you look at uh, the development over the season, how would you say going into this season, where are you at? Oh, much better. I'm, I'm so excited. Pam Miller had our ARCA call today, actually, with all the talent for the broadcast. And, you know, the storylines, there's so many. And I got to go to the test. So I'm like, I got all this. This is so fun. Now let's go. Let's go racing. And we could talk about these stories. There's so much diversity in that series. I mean, the women that are racing and uh, it's just, it's such a cool series in so many ways. And as I learned last year, a lot of those names are the future superstars of the sport. Ty Gibbs, for instance. I mean, he's a phenom and now he's moving up to the Xfinity series full time. And I got to know him as he developed in ARCA. Um, so I'm feeling a lot better. I'm just excited to be there now. The nerves aren't so much like, oh my gosh, I hope I don't fail. Um, it's more like, let's do this again. I think it's only going to be better. What are some of the other differences that you notice from the pit reporting side to being in the booth? Well, I learned that, you know, as a pit reporter, you have so much knowledge because you go, you go and you talk to the people, you get straight from the horse's mouth and, and you get so many little nuggets. Well, when you're in the booth, yes, you need to story tell, but you also have an analyst or two analysts next to you that you need to set up. You need to let them fill in the blanks and talk. So it's kind of like being a traffic control cop where I need to set up, I can tell a story about somebody, but I need to bring them in to explain a little bit more. So, and it's hitting your, your timing. It's like, read this sponsor ad and then get us to break and then come back. And then there's just so many little nuances that you don't have to do as a reporter. How many days are you away from home? Well, I'm very lucky at Fox. Um, you know, I work the first half of the cup season and then I do truck still the second half. But last year I did 53 races over four series. So I was away a lot, but I mean, I worked at ESPN where I covered the entire year. I went 29 straight weeks without a break one time before I was a wife and a mom. And that would be very difficult to do right now. I would do it because I love my job and my family understands it, but I get so much time home the second half of the year that I know I'm very lucky because so many people in motorsports, they miss out on so much at home.
You mentioned the support of your husband earlier when you took this new role. And when you're not on the road, you are wife and mother at home as well as a business owner. With the balance of the professional versus per, per personal career, how much does their support mean to you? It's everything to me. You know, I, I just, when you're just living for yourself and being a reporter and working, it's awesome. That's, that's, you know, one perspective of life, but I always knew that I wanted to get married. I wanted to experience everything in life. And I got married to Cody and he worked in racing when we met. So he totally got it, totally understood, you know, what my role was. And he still does to this day, but I have to have his support. You know, when I say, you know, I got to be on calls all day long, or I've got to jump on the plane tomorrow. I got a call. I've got to go to this event or this test or whatever. And like last week I was gone a whole week. And I'm home for a week and then I'm gone all next week for Daytona, that it's okay. He would never question anything. And my kids do. Now they're old enough. Why do you have to leave again? Um, but I know that one day they will understand the sacrifice and you know what I did for our life and to allow us to, to do this and how cool mo mom's job was. And uh, I for the business owner side, talk about that because I find that fascinating as well as that you're also an entrepreneur. Yes. Well, I find that um, usually when I say I'm an owner of nothing bunt cakes, a lot of people get excited because it's like the best cake. If you never tried it, it's a franchise and they're all over the country. We own two here in Indianapolis, but um, my husband leads the franchise. Uh, that's, that's his deal, but we got into it. We bought a friend's, we started a franchise in Vegas, um, Jimmy John's because they were so involved in racing and it just, it made sense. It was a good model. Um, so we have two there and then the bunk cakes here and uh, it's great. I, you know, I say it's always important to have a plan B. It's hard to have a plan B when you're in racing, but um, you know, in working with so many broadcasters, I learned that you never know when it's over. You never know when your contract's not going to be renewed and, and you need to have a backup plan. So that was kind of the strategy there. When you think about that, it actually reminds me of going back to 2020 and when the whole industry came to a stop and NASCAR being one of the first to go back racing. How did you handle that transition of you have season happening and then all of a sudden everyone's home and everything has stopped? Yeah, it, it was so wild because the season started totally normal and I got on a plane and flew to Atlanta and I was ready to go to the racetrack on Friday. And and everybody knows what happened next. I mean, everything shut down. NASCAR waited as long as they possibly could to say no and pull the plug. And we, we all flew home. Um, it was so wild. You know, not only like your job gets put on hold, but then your kids are home and you're, you're homeschooling them. And um, I was so proud to be, though, part of NASCAR for what they did and how they got back literally two months after we shut down, we were back to racing and we did it smart. We did it safely. And it was, it was the best medicine for everyone. That's a motorsports fan. I think I was, I was so proud to be part of it then. And, um, and they continued, I mean, whatever they needed to do to alter, to modify, as you guys know, last year, running the Daytona road course or running a different track because that state wasn't allowing things. Um, it was just amazing. It, it was something I'll never forget. And also learning to interview drivers. A driver would win a race and we only had one reporter at a time. So if I was at home and not there, I would do the winner interview. And, um, and so literally like 20 minutes after they're in victory lane on TV, I'd run in here just like this and do the interview with the winner. And it was so bizarre, but it was how we were making TV and, and it worked. When you talk about how proud you are of NASCAR, I want to finally get into the discussion of last weekend. I think the clash took everyone's attention uh, of what they were able to pull off and just the risk they took of having this race inside of the LA Coliseum. You get on site. I know you guys were there a couple of days earlier, but when you saw this, you see the track inside of this stadium. What is your, just like, what are you thinking at that moment? It was incredible. It looked like a movie set. Like, you're like, that's not, they, they built a racetrack in there and it was pristine. Everything was done. I mean, to the nth degree, like it was perfect. And the funny thing was 
I had covered Supercross there ages ago and X Games. So in my mind, I'm remembering like the peristyles back behind me there. There was dirt everywhere and the, the riders would jump into the stadium and, and then they would, you know, they had a whole course set up for freestyle motocross. So in my mind, I'm remembering what it looked like there. And I walked in, I'm like, other than the peristyle, like this place is so different. And we're going to race here on a track this short. I've never covered a race this short, you know, the track this, this short. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. And everybody was so open to it and excited about it. Sure, there was a lot of questions with the new car and, you know, what kind of problems we might encounter because it's the first time they're racing them. Um, but I couldn't have asked for better the way that it all went, as you guys all saw, like it wasn't fake. I mean, everybody was so enthusiastic about it. Even drivers that were, you know, eliminated, didn't even make it to the clash. They were smiling about the whole experience. It was, it was unlike anything I've covered before. And behind you during that interview, you can see all the fans standing up there. What was the energy of the day from a crowd standpoint? Huge energy. I mean, you had, we had two concerts, basically two performances going on and they were all just so fired up. You could tell a lot of people had never been to a NASCAR race. I think they said 70% had never been. So they were buying their first tickets and you could feel like they were loving what they were seeing. Guys would get side by side the battle for the lead. I would literally look up and everybody would stand up and they'd applaud and they loved, you know, Kyle had his lovers and then he had all the people that hate him too. And Joey has the same, you know, people either love him or hate him. So it was like the perfect scenario. And um, it was really cool afterwards, just watching people sit in the stands and just take it in, like watching the trophy presentation and everything was new. And one thing that stood out to me was the merchandise trailers. The lines were incredible. People went there and went to the merch trailers. It was 70 people deep. I mean, for rows and rows. So people really came in like full bore and wanted to be part of it and immersed in NASCAR. Would you say this is a new era for the sport? That's exactly how I've been putting it. It's not just the next gen car. It's, it's a new era for NASCAR. And it's, you know, I, I feel like it's long overdue. NASCAR did the same thing for so long, same track, same kind of car. And now they're, they're not afraid to change. They're not afraid to take risks. And I feel like we really need to do that. And we were talking before you guys open this up. And I feel like a win for NASCAR is a win for motorsports. We need people rooting for motorsports. What more about the next gen car? What impressed you about it? It's sexier. It looks and sounds more like a race car. You know, I liken it to when I covered the Rolex 24, my first impression was like, wow, these cars are throaty, they're sexy, they look like race cars, the ground effects, just the low profile tires. Now we have that in NASCAR. And I think that's something that people really like. I don't care if you're younger, if you're an older generation NASCAR fan, it looks more like the street car that you can get and modify to sound and sound like that and have, you know, more horsepower. It's amazing. It, it's it's a big change for NASCAR and I'm excited about it. And hopefully you guys could tell from the cam camera angles, it really is different. I had read a tweet from one of the NASCAR reporters saying that uh, there was really no negative energy. You know how media people can be. There's some sort of hesitation or there's some sort of, <laughs> hey, this isn't going to work. But it seemed like everyone was on the same page throughout the day. What do you think that event will be remembered for? I think it'll be remembered for taking a giant leap forward for NASCAR that was much needed. And, you know, many people can take, you know, credit for it, but Ben Kennedy led that effort. It was his vision. Um, I mean, his, his great grandfather, his grandfather family has been so immersed in it. And it's just so refreshing to see him take on that role, getting out of the truck, getting out of the race car and, um, and taking the reins and being bold. I think we need that if we want to get new fans. We go from Los Angeles that will hold the Super Bowl in a couple of weeks to you're going to your Super Bowl, which is the Daytona 500 in the NASCAR world that week. Is it, I would imagine that even as long as you've been covering NAS, NASCAR, there's something still so special about landing in Daytona. There is. It's special. Everybody wants to win the Daytona 500. And, you know, I covered IndyCar for a long time and the Indy 500 is very much the same. It's a holy grail it's a coveted place and that's how it is for the nascar world in daytona and 
And I still pinch myself. I never take it for granted that I get to be standing there, especially in this day and age. There's more people that want to be reporters than ever before. It's very competitive. So they still want to have me there as I get older. I, I pinch myself. I'm very lucky to be part of it every year. And, um, you know, that race is just one of my favorites for many reasons. But I, I love the intensity of that place. I love pack racing. I like the danger. I like all of those things. And um, this year will be really special with a new car. And um, we've got a lot of cars. There's going to be people getting bumped out. We've got Jacques Villeneuve trying to make the race. How amazing is that? Have you taken a lap around Daytona before? I have, yes, multiple times. I love that. Early on in my career, um, I went to as many racing schools as I could. I probably did seven or eight, even got my, um, my racing license in California. I think it was SBCA at, at the time. Um, I, cause I wanted to be a race car driver. I loved it, but I obviously didn't have the money to do it. And I, um, stuck to my day job, but I, I love and appreciate racing so much. Um, it's pretty cool. If I could be something else, it would be a race car driver. I would imagine it's probably hard to pinpoint one, but as you look over your career, are there some moments that stick out to you that are inspirational or that have been more meaningful to you than others? Yeah, definitely my first Indy 500 in 2004. Like that was a moment for me, very pivotal that I knew I was going to stick around for a while. It was just, it was such a special moment in my life. Um, obviously when I signed with Fox, getting to do the Daytona 500 was absolutely incredible. Um, I've gotten to do so many cool things. You know, getting to cover the Rolex 24 was awesome. Just something so different. Um, and there's, you know, there's moments that have defined me as a, as a broadcaster, I think. And when Dan Weldon was killed in Las Vegas, dealing with that on the air, and we happened to be so close as well. We were just buddies for years. And um, I think watching and feeling how I was as a broadcaster in those moments, I realized, okay, I could take on anything. Um, so yeah, mo I mean, all moments, good, bad, whatever. I've, I've seen a lot of it, especially in the days of covering Supercross and X Games. I saw a lot of bad things and, and you just learn to be a hard hitting reporter, I guess, or, you know, and, and keep emotion out of it and just deliver the facts. I think that there are some other special guests inside that room with you as well. What are some of the other passions that you were so focused on? Can you, sis, sis can come. Just say hi to everybody real quick. There's a lot more people on here now. This is Carter. I was <laughs> pregnant with him at the Indy 500 in 2012. And here's Sierra. Can you say hi, sis? Hi. She's a little spitfire like I am. Do you guys get to watch mom on TV? Yeah. What do you think? Isn't that fun for you? Yeah. He Googled me at school recently and I was so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't really get it because they kind of just grew up getting to see me on TV, which I was always very thankful because they knew like they couldn't see mom, but they could see me on TV and know that, you know, oh, she's there. Okay, that's what she's doing. What are you doing? It's never, never a dull moment. She's checking out the memorabilia. <laughs> Well, Jamie, as much as I know that uh, from the rescue side of things, you're very involved on that. But uh, as we mentioned earlier on, there wasn't um, necessarily a female in your career at that point that could help you or inspire you or mentor you at that point. I know that is something that you are fiercely passionate about that now. Why is it so important to you to help this next generation? Well, I feel like it's it's so nice to have somebody to bounce ideas off of or somebody to see as an example um, and somebody that's just open. I remember there was one woman that was, um, she was a live broadcaster, um, when I was coming up and I was like, gosh, that is so cool. I would love to do what she did. And she didn't give me the time of day, like just not, you know, very competitive, would not even talk with me, had no interest. And I remember thinking, I am never going to be that way. If I ever get to that level, I will always stop and talk to somebody that has a question for me. I believe it's important. I mean, if nothing else, it's just being able to ask some questions or, you know, get a contact or something like you all do here. It's all about contacts and, and um, hey, I know somebody that can help you with this or that. That's what it's all about. 
Wendy on one of our uh, in the chat room pointed out about your memorabilia. Can you highlight some of the things that are on that shelf behind you? Let's show, let's show here. Well, my daughter just took off the uh, Kyle Bush race car. She's pushing it around <laughs> on the floor. Um, I love Kyle Bush because he has I love Kyle Bush because he has M&Ms, my daughter just said. Um, hold on, Carter, let's show this. The, a brick from Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Oh, he's got all the cars Whoa, to show you. This is actually like. <laughs> I know. Up here to the right, when I won the Toyota Pro Celebrity Race, that's my trophy. That was like the coolest okay, day. Tell us more about that. How did you win that trophy? So I raced in the Toyota Pro Celebrity Race. Um, it was pros and celebs. Well, Mike Skinner came through the field on the last lap all over my rear bumper. He tried to spin me in the last corner in the hairpin. I kept my foot in the gas, kept it straight, and I won the freaking race. It was the same day Danica Patrick won her race in Japan, but um, it was so incredible. It was just, it was the neatest experience because I got to see that side of it. I always talk to racers about what they do, but I got to feel that and understand fully that love and passion for winning. Lynn St. James had mentioned about how when you talked about ARCA being kind of this feeder system for women and and the non-conventional uh, driver. Do you feel like we'll see a female in NASCAR knocking on the door soon? I hope so. Because as we all know, there are many women out there that are good. We just need to see more opportunities for them. And the ARCA series, like I said, has been so great. We've got Tony Breidinger coming up. We've got um, Amber Balkan. She's gonna be full-time in the ARCA series from Canada. She's the real deal. She's been racing for 20 years. Finally, this is the first time she has a full-time ride in a national series like this. So I really hope that they can step up and do good things. Um, but Haley Deegan, she's on the path. I mean, they are taking the, I just saw she and her whole family. I've, I've known Haley since she was two weeks old. Her dad <laughs> was freestyle motocross. I was covering it and there was baby Haley. Yeah. Um, thanks, babe. Um, but she's, they're on the right path. They have a plan. So she, this has to be a big year for her. I feel like she really needs to step it up a little bit. And I think she will. Last year was the first time learning tracks and she did it with no practice anywhere we went. So this year will be good for her. And then I know that, that they definitely want to move up Xfinity and in cup one day, her dad, Brian said to me at the clash, it's going to be really cool one day when we come back here and Haley's out there racing in cup. And I really hope that's the truth. Diane wants to know, what was your favorite racing school? <clears throat> I think, gosh, it was the Skip Barber School at Fontana. It was in Finneon, um, or not Fontana, Sonoma. It was in Finneon Raceway back then. Open wheel, it was so cool. I even wrecked a car and cost myself some money. But that was the most fun, just open wheel. The stock cars were fun too on ovals, um, but I really like the road course stuff. And then from Wendy, what do you aspire to be next? Gosh, what's next? Um, I always, I'm like, I used to get asked all the time, when are you going to do Monday night football? Because I work for ESPN. And I always said, I, I have my Monday night football. It's Sunday cup racing. Um, so I don't know. I would say I, I love the play-by-play -play so much. I would love to move up. Um, but we have great broadcasters at Fox. So if that opportunity ever came, I think I would, I would jump on it. Um, but I think that would be next. Have you spoken to other play-by-play -play females in the industry? Maybe not necessarily in motorsports, but a Beth Moens or Doris, Doris Burke? I have not. I would love to just to, you know, see their path and just kind of how they've been received and, and how it's gone. But no, I would, I would love to, but haven't talked to them. Definitely talked to plenty of the men, you know, ones that I admire so much from Mike Joy to Alan Bestwick going into it and got their perspective and just their process. You know, how do you guys prepare? And everybody has a completely different way. It's crazy. It's literally from some have a sheet of paper with a few notes and others are like me that um, I'll show you guys what I kind of do for a race. You know, I do a sheet like this, I type, type it up and then I write in my own stories for every, every driver. So I have something to refer to if I don't remember it. We had uh, Deb Williams on the podcast uh, about a month or so ago, and she talked about just how meaningful this career has been to her life. What is this 
industry, this motorsport space, what has it meant to you, Jamie? Everything. I mean, I have a great life because of racing. I mean, I literally walked down the stairs in my house today and I'm like, this is the house that, you know, ESPN and Fox built, you know, thank, I'm so thankful for it. I love what I do and I get paid to do it. That's the secret to life. I think, um, it's meant everything. And as long as I still love so much what I do and Sunday, I think you could feel the energy and, and how much I love it. Um, as long as I have that, I hope they keep me around. What are the, some of the stories in NASCAR that you've covered through the years that you're most proud of? Gosh, there's so many. I mean, everything from, you know, like going to Daytona and Denny Hamlin's pursuit of like last year going for four or going for three and then being in victory lane with him when he got number three. Um, you know, it's the, the drivers that are doing the send off. I remember covering Jeff Gordon in, in his final year and just like, like, this is a, this is Jeff Gordon. Every time I interview him, it's like historic in my mind and to get to cover his last season. Um, at ESPN, I got to always cover the championship race and to be there like when Kevin Harvick crossed the finish line or, or Kyle Busch, I got to cover him for Fox there when he crossed the, like to me, crowning champions um, is, is where it's at. Being in victory lane with a driver when they want to race, there's no better energy. And then on the opposite of this from Lynn St. James, what story have you not been able to tell? Gosh. I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, you know, may, I, I don't know, maybe not so much in NASCAR, but maybe in other series where there were injuries or things that happened that you really, you couldn't tell, you know what I like, I, I don't know, maybe times like that, but I feel like in my role, you have a story and, and you're able to tell it. Um, obviously there's privy information that you get in the garage that, you know, you hear the truth and, and you're not going to out them because you need your, your people in your corner still, you need them to share information with you. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I remember one time covering X games. I can't remember if it was like 2011 or 12 and I was covering the snowmobile freestyle and we had a guy crash right, right behind me. And, um, he was like, you know, he was out, out cold medical teams there, which I saw all the time. Um, and I ran over to his brother who was competing and, and he's like, oh, he just got his bell rung. Like, you know, he's going to be fine. So I go on camera with him behind me and all the medical team. And, and I said, well, his brother told me he was, he was knocked out. And, um, and then you see him get up with the medical team and they take him off and Aspen is, <clears throat> and, uh, Moments later, somebody came up to me and they're like, that that's, it's bad. It's not good. And, uh, he died the next day. And that's when you realize like, you have to be so careful about reporting things. Like you can't go on because somebody is knocked out. Oh, he just has a concussion. Thankfully I didn't do that, but his brother told me he had only gotten his head hit. Um, but that taught me a big lesson in reporting right then that, you know, you can't assume anything. You can't assume that they're fine. And that's what, you know, in NASCAR, you see these guys go through it just because they went to the infield care center doesn't mean they're okay. Um, so yeah. Angelica Hathaway and I, sorry, I'm gonna have to pinpoint you here on just one. What's been your most memorable interview? Oh gosh. Well, <laughs> there's, I've interviewed some amazing people from, I mean, AJ Foyt, Parnelli Jones. Um, but I would say, and you know, this maybe isn't popular, but you have to look at the big picture. Um, a sitting president, when I got to interview Donald Trump at the Daytona 500 was a pretty incredible moment. Just what I had to go through, background checks, the White House calling me, they actually requested that I do the interview and my bosses gave me the choice to say yes or no. And um, it was, I mean, that's a moment that you look beyond politics and you're like, this is a sitting president at a racetrack. Of course, I can't turn this down. Um, that was, that was a big moment to me. And, and probably the last time I've been that nervous, my hands were dripping sweat <laughs> and, uh, it went okay. It worked out. And then one last question from the group from Tiffany, what helps you best remember the people you meet among the masses? What's what stands out or 
I guess how you kind of focus in on details or how do you remember of, of the thousand people that you come across, how do you remember people individually? That is so hard um, because I don't feel like I'm great at remembering people. I, I remember faces better than names. I think a lot of people are like that, but I always try to make people feel like I care. Even if I don't remember you, I'm never like, I'm not sure. It's always, you want to make people, you know, people, when they watch you on TV, they feel like they know you. And now with social media, people certainly feel like they know you and your whole life story. So when people come up, it's like, they expect you to like know them. So I feel like it's very important to make people feel okay and cared for and that you appreciate them, no matter if you remember them or not. But we do have one more question. I think this one is, is really important. And from Karen Brown, you're a busy woman. What do you do for self-care? And in parentheses, besides owning a Bundt cake store. <laughs> um, I'm big into working out. I definitely make that a priority. I'm not, you know, I'm not the, I'm not like a Jamie McMurray. That's like, I got to run every single day. So I just can't do that. But I work out at least three or four times a week. I feel like that is a good balance for my body, but my, my mental capacity and handling, you know, especially like this week coming up, um, playing with my dogs, playing with my kids. We just went sledding right before this call. We were out bonsaiing down this mud hill. Like it was so much fun. Um, and travel. I love traveling with my family and going to visit my parents back in Vegas, but self-care. Yes. I definitely, um, some massage and, you know, but working out's the main thing. And your favorite flavor of Bundt cake? Uh, white chocolate raspberry. What's yours? Uh, uh, chocolate peppermint. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the Christmas flavor. Yeah, the Christmas flavor. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, thank you again for sharing this hour with us and telling your story. And um, I know that uh, this group of women, uh, this has been such a special treat to share these months uh, over the last year and a half. I can't even believe it's been a year and a half. So thank you for popping on with us.